Nah, I'm not doing just an episode on Game & Watch. I'm going to be doing every generation of Nintendo and take you out of the boundaries of every game that I cover of each generation, which means that by the end of this video, you're going to be as far forward as the Nintendo Switch, and uh, to start, we're going to go as far backwards as Nintendo's very first game, which is Game & Watch Ball. So why don't we get started on this bad boy? So for full transparency here, I'm using the Club Nintendo version of Game & Watch Ball. And right off the bat, you're going to notice a couple things on the inside of this device. Over on the right side here, you're going to notice that the number 2 is written in Sharpie, and I'll get back to that in a second. But also the gray rubber underneath where the screen is supposed to be are contact points for the board, which is really cool. It has adhesive on it, and then when you take the board itself, which I'm going to show you right now, it pretty much just glues and makes communications with these contacts here. You're also going to notice that the board is printed with a lot of specifics. It goes as far as to label all the buttons for you on the board itself. And again, you might notice the number 2 written in Sharpie over here. Now this was something that completely blew my mind. During the assembly of this Game & Watch, human hands touched this board and wrote in Sharpie. And all I can say for now is that the number 2 clearly represents what side it is. And the 2 on this board is supposed to meet with the 2 on the casing. On the other side, however, there's all sorts of jargon that I've reached out to tons of people for to try Try and make some sense out of but unfortunately unless you were part of that assembly line it's going to be a lot harder to be able to tell what a lowercase d means or an a1 or possibly a3 all i could confirm is that some companies have factory checkers people who confirm and test certain parts of a board and then leave their initials behind to show that they tested it which after opening up a bunch of hardware for my hardware episode i wasn't expecting anything like this <laughs> hey you know what i thought this segment was actually going to be kind of boring but it ended up being uh kind of cool but with that said, how about we get started and really amp up episode 100 of an ongoing series where we basically take the camera anywhere we want and we try to find secrets and new discoveries to some of our favorite games. And with that said, let's get started with the Nintendo Entertainment System. I guess I'll, um, I'll break my own screen. So, with the Nintendo Entertainment System, I want to show you a couple games I haven't covered on the channel yet. Like, for example, what goes on with this door at the very start of Super Mario Bros. 2. Now, this was a bit of a tricky one because even if you can do moon jumps and stuff, you need a surface to stand on in order to go through any door in Super Mario Bros. 2. So what I had to do was break the environment itself and move the platform up to the door. And by doing that, you'll see that it takes you right to the start of the game again, just in a different position. Now believe it or not, the door had to be programmed this way. It couldn't be left with no value. And the same can be said for these quote unquote windows at the end of the game. I say quote unquote because they are in fact doors. And if you go through them, it also takes you through the next room that you're supposed to go through, but once again, dropped in a completely different position than if you had just gone through the actual door you were supposed to go to. And at the very end of Super Mario Bros. 2, if you were to remove the background layer, you can see half of a turnip sprite turned brown. So part of the celebration of episode 100 is that you're going to see clips from past episodes. And when you do, you're going to see a little lower third graphic over in the corner here telling you which episode it came from. And of course, if you want to see the full episode to whatever game I cover here, I'll have links to every single one in the video description right underneath the video that you're looking at right now. Anyways, if you hadn't seen the Super Mario Brothers 3 episode, did you know that the throne rooms actually have graphics outside of the boundaries? This was thanks to Necron who disabled the screen locks to these areas. And because of that effort, you can not only see that the letter from Princess Peach is always resting above the throne room, but the developers also made a weird textured wall behind the throne room as well. I'm gonna assume this wall was never used because it's a little disorienting when you look at it for too long. In fact, I learned my lesson from the last time I actually showed this clip and tried to make sure that Mario was only walking slowly so that it doesn't hurt your eyes. Here we go, The Legend of Zelda. It's my favorite one in the series to be honest with you, and uh, what are we gonna see here? You'll see that there's a separate layer for additional details to the vines that wrap around the logo, as well as the sword itself is on a separate layer, so if you remove the sword, you can see more of the Triforce. As far as stepping outside the boundaries of The Legend of Zelda, the developers thought ahead on this subject. So if you walk all the way past the edge of the map on the overworld screen, he gets warped to the very first screen of the game, just not in the center of the map like you start the game. He instead starts over by the cave entrance. 
So one of the things I always hate about video games is when it implies something and you can kind of see what's going on, but you can't be shown exactly what's happening. And at the end of The Legend of Zelda 2, it's implied that Princess Zelda kisses Link in some way behind the curtain. Now, if you remove that curtain, there's two things to look at. One, of course, is the fact that, uh, She's really more giving him a friendly little hug. Link, I feel for you, buddy. And also at the top of the screen, there's some weird artifacts going on. Something that you're obviously not meant to see, and it has no purpose whatsoever, but in every copy of The Legend of Zelda 2 underneath this layer, you could see this weird mesh of white graphics. So in the original Super Mario Brothers, one of the most interesting things about this game is that all the bonus areas are connected into one large map. Now the way that they segment them is that the game is programmed to stop scrolling once you go into a certain bonus area. However, once again, thanks to Necron, if we allow the screen to scroll freely, you'll see all the bonus areas one after another. And to answer the question that some of you are thinking, yes, if you were to go into any one of these pipes, it would technically warp you to whatever area it's attached to. Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, how about we see what the Master Sword looks like without anything obstructing it? And uh, for that matter, what does the background look like without anything obstructing it? Well, there you go. So, for A Link to the Past, if you go outside the boundaries, a lot of things get pretty strange for this one. Primarily speaking, all the dungeons are interconnected into one large map. And just like the Earthbound episode that I covered way, way back, the tiles are all set up in place, but the theme of those tiles get loaded in when you go into a certain door. So if we're in a dark, nasty dungeon and we're trying to lead the Princess Zelda out into safety, well, taking a sharp right turn through this wall here can bring you to exactly where she needs to be. But the problem is, is that palette hasn't loaded in. So you still have the dark dungeon aesthetic. And one of the really weird things here too is that some of the tiles suddenly have different properties to them. You might remember that at a certain point in the game, you're trying to chase down Aghanim and you slash your sword at a tapestry to open up a pathway. Well, some of these tiles here are certainly not cloth based at all but you slash at it with a sword and it will make that functionality you can definitely hear the sound effects as well as a change in sprites So, with Super Mario World, we got things that are hidden behind layers. First thing I want to show you is the lava monster Blarg. You can see that the developers did not have a whole lot to show you behind the scenes, with a separate sprite being made specifically for him peeking out of the lava. Now with Lemmy, it's kind of the same thing, whereas with most of these unique sprites, there isn't anything to show below what the player can see outside of the fact that his body parts do go all the way in and all the way out of these pipes. But in some cases though, you can see his full body sprite for a single frame. This is right before it transitions into another sprite that is used to peek out of the pipe. For Yoshi's Island, we can do the same thing. In fact, uh, let's talk about the enemy that's right on the front of the box of the game, Nepa Nut. If you remove the opaque water layer from Epa Nut, you can see that the character collapses in on itself and that his fangs even go through his body. And as for the Lakitu with the scuba gear, removing the layer around him shows that he has a water texture attached to his body, which is really interesting because if you kill him, it shows his entire body as he falls off the screen. So, huh. But best of all, if you remove a layer on the level select screen, you'll see that the graphics used to depict the environment continues on past the scrolls, revealing details never shown to the player before. And that doesn't happen very often. I mean, the entire intro sequence has a border around it as well, and probably the only thing that can't be shown to the player is the entire length of Yoshi's arms. Now, in case you never saw the Earthbound episode, let me give you a zoom out of one of its most iconic areas, Foreside, and reveal to you that the city that seems so big and so massive when you play the game is, in fact, kind of small compared to what a metropolis is supposed to be. I did a Super Smash Bros. 64 video that didn't really get any attention. I don't know what it was about it, but it had some really cool stuff in it. And since I had a chance to go back to it, I recollected the footage so that it's a little bit better and show you a couple things like, for example, everything going on in this bedroom. You're gonna see here that if you turn the camera completely around, there's a door that's never shown to the player. And I believe that's a landmine being used as a doorknob, which if that's the case, I feel so bad for the kid. But also you're gonna see before the cutscene starts, there's a tissue box on the floor. And that's before it gets put on top of the desk. So where it starts off initially, you never get to see. Also, of course, 
course, we gotta see what's going on with that Pokemon trainer that walks by Pikachu. And what you're going to see right now is an example of the game developments. A lot of the time, if the player's never meant to see something, you never take the time to make it. And so all we have here are a pair of legs. And why not? Let's do a zoom out of Race to the Finish. So with the Super Mario 64 episode, one of my favorite parts about it was seeing how the menus operated. Yeah, of all things, really. But if you look behind some of these objects, you can see that they have textures on the back of them. And also the title screen itself is also made up of 3D. And there's lots of details that you can't see about it because it's always front facing. However, if you look behind it, there's no modeling in the back for this. I also really liked how great the zoom out looked for TikTok clock. I thought that was excellent. Now here's a game I did not cover on the show yet, and that is Mario Party. The first one specifically. And while I was recently playing with my friends, I noticed that the quality of the game doesn't allow you to see some of the features of it. But I noticed that some of the characters looked a little bit odd off in the distance when it wasn't their turn. So using the camera with full resolution, I decided to zoom in and see what exactly is going on. And as you can see, they basically turn into Mario themed sorry pieces. <laughs> They have extremely basic geometry for what their quote unquote body is, and then they place a head on top. One of the craziest things about the 30 minute Ocarina of Time episode is that for some reason, and this is pretty exclusive to the game itself, most of these areas that use 2D images as the backgrounds had 3D objects hidden behind them. So. Every person who plays Ocarina of Time may see these 2D textures, but right behind it are these textureless environments. Out of the 100 episodes I've done, this is probably one of the most jaw-dropping moments in my opinion. Also in the Hyrule Marketplace, you can see that all of these NPCs are very low detail. It is great that they have any textures at all, because a lot of these are facing completely away from the camera, never to be seen. And it's, uh, it's probably for the best that it never was supposed to be seen, because these are not the prettiest looking character models, I have to admit. And of course, one of my favorite moments from that episode is finding out that Sheik's face is underneath that disguise. By removing the texture that is supposed to cover her face, you find that she does have a mouth and a chin. Something you don't always see when there's a character that is masked or disguised in some way. GameCube, one of my favorite generations. So first up is Animal Crossing. And one of the things that always kind of bothered me when you first start up the game is that Rover goes off into another cabin. Now what really bothers me about it is that he clearly pulls out a flip phone that you never get to see at a good angle in this game because it's only used here in this one scene. Taking the camera over though shows that the phone is fully modeled and even has something on its display screen, which is a series of signal bars. And in Metroid Prime, which by the way was one of the least viewed episodes on the show, we got ourselves Meta Ridley. Now remember this scene because I'm going to bring it up again in a little bit. One of the details to Meta Ridley that's really hard to see is that if you zoom in on his chest cavity, you can see that he has an exposed heart. So it's very difficult to notice because the character is usually very far away from Samus, as well as a big bright light that kind of covers up the image. Ah, oh, you gotta love Pikmin. Now, it was really hard to find a whole lot of good stuff for Pikmin, but one of the developers left a little Easter egg for himself. If you were to take the camera outside of the boundaries, you could see the developer's name hidden away, which is Toyota, who was the designer in charge of the interface. In Fire Emblem Path of Radiance, you don't get a good look at the characters, but they're all 3D models. And there's a reason why you never get a great look at the characters, because if you were to take the camera up to the map models, they are incredibly low detailed, and the textures on their faces are unusual at best. Now, when they're in battle, they use a much better model, but even then, if you take a close look at some of their faces, they, uh, they don't really represent the characters very well. Like, for example, Ike over here has a very funny smirk, not very befitting of the character. Now with Chibi Robo, oh yeah, we're going there. What other time am I gonna be able to talk about Chibi Robo and people actually click onto the video? So we got ourselves an outdoor scene here. And if you were to take the camera inside the house and underneath the floorboards, you can find a couple of things being stored away for later use. 
one of which being the eggplant from the game Wrecking Crew. Fairly uncommon to see characters just stored outside of the boundaries for this long. It's a little more common to see them stored like this when they're about to be in a cutscene. Also, if we were to take the camera around the neighborhood, you get to see something kind of cool. There's like a pathway that goes through all the houses, and then it ends at this sky dome. But if you were to go past the sky dome, the path still continues. Not that you would ever get a good look of the path hitting the sky dome, but if somehow you managed to in game, you'd still not be able to see all the details to this pathway. And of course, we gotta do a zoom out in Super Mario Sunshine, showing that if you were able to take the camera high above the sky in the first level of Super Mario Sunshine, you could see Isle Delfino in its entirety, which of course, if you're a fan of Super Mario Sunshine, you'd know that the island is supposed to be in the shape of a dolphin. To start on the Wii generation, we're going to talk about Wii Sports. Now, this clip was used from episode 26, and much to my surprise, became one of the most popular episodes. This is despite the fact that there wasn't a lot to show in this episode. It was more of a tour of all the sports area's environments. However, there were a couple things to show off in the tennis area. Like, for example, the spot where the Mii's come out of have doors that are shut at all times. However, if you were to take the camera past the doorway, you could see that there's a little bit of extra area that the player is normally meant to see if a door is open. Also took a moment to appreciate the buildings that are far off in the background. Normally you can't see these things up close at all. However, the buildings on both sides are completely different from one another. They're structured completely differently. Though all windows have this same generic texture attached to it, which is just a green pasture with a single tree on it. In fact, a lot of areas in the Wii Sports episode had a lot of details outside the boundaries, which is pretty incredible because you can never have full control of the cameras in any of the events. Next up is an episode that I haven't covered on Boundary Break, it's Metroid Prime 3. And although it's an episode I definitely have to cover at some point, for now you can take a look at the scene where Samus is inside of her ship, and there is a lot to unpack here, so let me take you through it. First of all, it's really crazy to see the entire Samus model is sitting here in the ship despite the fact that you're in first person. Normally, if you take the game outside the boundaries in a first person shooter, the head or as much as the upper torso is completely missing so that it doesn't get in the way of the camera. However, Samus's arms are bent backwards so that the player can never see those, because you do get control of her arms, and if her character model arms were shown on top of the arms that the player has control over, you'd start to see double vision. Now as for the ship itself, there's a lot of trickery going on here. The skybox is actually really small, and the ship is not rendered on the outside, except for the parts of the ship that you would normally see in-game, which is the wings, they're kind of like the parts of Samus's ship that jettison outward. Those you can see, and those are rendered on all sides. So with all that said, I want to give you a second to breathe this all in, because I know it's kind of a mess, <laughs> but it is really interesting to look at. Hey, remember when I told you to keep that Ridley scene in the back of your head? Well, this is why, because in Super Smash Bros. Brawl, Meta Ridley comes back as a boss and as a trophy. But the developers of Super Smash Bros. Brawl did something a little bit different to the model. You might notice that there's a weird chest plate where the heart used to be. Now, I have to imagine this was all an attempt to lower the game's rating or just for the sake of the children. But funny thing about it is that if you take the camera through that chest plate, the texture for the heart still remains. So the Super Mario Galaxy episode will be a great example of something that is a lot of fun to look at in Boundary Break. If something retracts into itself, there's a good chance that something funny is going on inside of its body. And that can absolutely be said for the Koopas. Taking the camera inside of the Koopa shell shows that the head shrinks down, but the limbs stay the same size. And this is only if you haven't picked up the shell yet. For some reason, when you pick up the shell, all the limbs completely disappear. And while we're on the same subject and the same game, let's talk about Dino Piranha. Now you see, Dino Piranha tries to keep most of its limbs relatively the same size as well, but the head has to be shrunken down in order to not clip through the egg shell. So what you get is a very disproportionate Dino Piranha before it cracks out of there. Now believe it or not, I actually get a couple requests now and then for Wii Fit. And you know what, after finally playing the game for a bit, I'm starting to see why. Let me first show you this scene with the Wii Fit Trainer. Unfortunately, if we take the camera around, we can see that the Wii Fit Trainer is trapped in a mirror room that she can never escape from because there are no exits for the Wii Fit Trainer. There's supposed to be mirrors on both sides, but depending on where the camera is pointed at, the other one gets called out. You can tell this by the shadow that's cast on the floor. 
and someone also wanted a zoom out of the ski area. And I'm very happy to accommodate that, but first let's take the camera inside of this area that's never shown to the player. And surprisingly, despite the fact that there isn't any objects in here, there is a unique texture for the floor, probably put in place as a safety net in case a camera angle did catch it, despite the fact that it never does. And like I said, here's a zoom out of the slopes. Now this is my favorite boundary break discovery. This is from the Punch Out Wii episode. And despite the fact that it's never shown to the player, Piston Hondo is reading Sailor Moon manga. It's a secret clearly not meant to be seen by the player because the licensing for Sailor Moon isn't even mentioned in the game's credits. Now I do got to apologize to you veteran Boundary Break fans because it's really hard to get cameras working for Wii U. So for this segment, I'm just going over some of my favorite scenes from the episodes I've already covered. Starting with Mario Kart 8. Mute City is particularly special for me because for whatever reason, a tweet that I made about it to hype up the episode on my Twitter account, it still stands today as the most popular tweet I've ever composed with 5,000 likes. And you gotta trust me, I'm not bragging here. It's still just one of those weird things that it just blows my mind to this day. The reason why that image got so popular though is that you can see the entire track in this red circle and everything outside of it is just backdrop scenery proving that sometimes Nintendo just puts in a ton of work for that immersion. But the other thing though, and I find this to be even more fun to look at, is the track Ribbon Road because the entire area is supposed to be a child's bedroom. But of course the camera angles never give you such a good look that it looks like you're walking around in this room, it always keeps it centered on the track. So to be able to pull the camera back and let you see the entire thing is way more interesting in my opinion. But hey, you tell me. From the Splatoon episode, it was really hard to find some new discoveries, but I was determined. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting is this hatch door that's underneath the Tanuki statue. This hatch door is never shown at an angle in which the player could see it, and it implies that at one point there might have been a story element in which the hatch doors were supposed to open, but they never do. In Super Smash Bros. for Wii U, the Yellow Devil comes out of Wily's castle. But if you take a look outside the boundaries, you can see there's a little bit of developer trickery here. The yellow globs that make up the Yellow Devil don't make a fully connected pathway to the stage. Instead, the yellow blobs in the background eventually stop, and then new yellow blobs spawn outside of the boundaries in the foreground. Now normally, if a character has a hat that never comes off the head, the hat just happens to be part of the character's geometry and they don't bother to make anything underneath the hat. However, it's my speculation that they originally had a hatless Link for the Skyward Sword costume and then later changed their minds. Here we go. Are we ready for a Super Mario Odyssey episode? I feel like it has to happen sometime soon. In the meantime though, here's two really good scenes that I wanted to show off to you. The first one is to show you what happens when you go outside of the boundaries of the concert hall. Now this is a little bit unusual. Typically going outside the rooms and areas like this take you into the void, a black nothingness that indicates that this area is loaded up on its own. But this is a special case because instead it takes you in the far outskirts of New Donk City. And we're going to take you all the way over to where the main area is to show you exactly where we end up when we warp to the concert hall. Also, you might notice that bridge over off in the distance there with all the cars going. What does that look like? Well, the cars themselves are extremely low poly, which is utterly fantastic. And where do they go exactly? Well, they go off of the bridge at a certain point and just keep going. It takes a really, really long time before they finally get unloaded from the map. And I gotta say, what better way to end this episode than to show you what the world 1-1 looks like inside the theater room from another angle. Gives you a little bit of a clue of how this whole segment actually works. So I was going to do this long outro, but I decided against it because I didn't want to mess up the analytics of this video. Uh, if you want to see that video, I'll have a link down below in the video description and it will take you to an unlisted video uh, where you can hear my thoughts about this whole journey that was up to 100 episodes. Uh, but, but here, I'll keep it short. Um, first of all, make sure you check out Hat Loving Gamer. He was the person who did the first three animated skits for this uh, video. Um, he does amazing videos uh, involving usually pixel animation. Um, and does parodies of Nintendo games. I'll actually leave a link to a collaboration I did with him 
for my um, April 1st video, April Fool's Day. It was really good, so I highly recommend you check that out. Uh, the other is Michael Chin 1994, and he was the very first animator for Boundary Break. So it was great to have him back, and uh, he's doing a new thing on Twitch, so I'll have a link to him as well. Um, but, you know, outside of that, I just want to thank you very much for watching this video. If you're brand new here, definitely check out some of the older videos. Like I said, I have links to all of them down below. It really helps me out, and it'll give you an idea of whether or not you uh, think this channel is right for you. But with that said, I hope to I hope to see some comments on that 10 minute long video. But if not, hope to see you next week. Take care. Thank you for watching episode 100.